Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video. Let me give you a quick little housekeeping update. I'm going to give you kind of the rundown of the week here in our weekly video as I always do. And uh, for those who are interested, I'm not going to do it in this video because, well at least I'm going to try not to, sometimes I can't resist the temptation, but I want to do a deeper dive into the Federal Reserve, the uh, impact they had on markets this week, and kind of the updated status. I'm going to do that at our Advice and Insights podcast. I think it's a more appropriate single subject treatment I'm going to give into the podcast there. Uh, so for those who are interested, check that out. I'll kind of do a whole lay of the land overview here in our, our video time today. Um, the DividendCafe.com weekly commentary is always where I most want people to go, where the vast entirety of the writing and all the charts and everything exist. And then the Dividend Cafe podcast oftentimes is very similar to what you're watching here in the video, but it's generally meant to just sort of mirror the, the writing. And then the video, I just sit here and I start talking. And, you know, to be honest, I really never know what I'm going to say. So let's get into it a little bit. Um, we're recording in the middle of the day Thursday. Very odd day because as I'm recording, the S&P 500 is actually up 20 points and the Dow is actually down 50. And that like really barely ever happens. But because of the Dow, I've talked about this before, and forgive me if it's redundant, I just thought it might be interesting to revisit this. The Dow is what's called a price-weighted index. So the way the Dow is valued, uh, the, the stocks that have high prices, them going up or down a certain percentage, moves the Dow more than a low-priced stock. Even if the low-priced stock is a bigger company, you know, it, the value of, let's say, a $50 stock might be $20 billion, and the value of a $100 stock might be $10 billion, but the $100 stock is going to move the, the value of the Dow more because it, its ingredients are priced around, are weighted around the price of the stock, which is very odd. And it's not really ideal, and it does create kind of anomaly days. But the, the defenders of the system say that over the years, it really is kind of all evened out in the end, and it mostly has. So all that to say, there's some stock in the Dow, and I actually, because it's not one we own, so I don't really care, uh, I don't really know exactly what's pulling the Dow down a bit today and what's otherwise a pretty darn good day in the market. Um, overall, though, for the week, it's been another positive week. And it looks like today is the last day of January, so I'm a few hours before January comes to an end, but it looks like it's going to be a stunningly big move higher for the markets in the month of January, double-digit uh, you know, return from our low point in late December. Uh, the day after Christmas, the market began this rebound from the carnage of, of the month of December. Um, but really the catalyst this week, including a 430-point up day yesterday, Wednesday in the Dow, was the Federal Reserve. And, and so like I said, I'll unpack that with more detail at our Advice and Insights podcast because uh, i got to go into things like balance sheet and quantitative tightening and um, the various methodology they're using to control short-term interest rates. And i got to talk about excess bank reserves. And these things get obviously more technical and therefore somewhat boring. And the intent of this video is as much as possible to not go into the boring things, but for those who desire that deeper end, they'll, they'll have the podcast. Certainly in a nutshell, I mean, I don't know that anything else has to be said. And the Fed has, to say they've blinked at this point is somewhat absurd. They've fully waved that white towel. And, and I make the comment in DividendCafe.com that if you listen to the language of what Chairman Powell was saying just this week, put it up against the language of what he was saying in December, it would sound like he was talking in different decades and certainly different years. The fact that it was literally just a few weeks apart is just really surreal. So do I believe that the Fed essentially capitulated to markets? I do. But I don't think it's as simple as saying, oh, the Fed's afraid of the stock market going down and so forth. I think that the Fed views it not, oh, well, because the market went down, therefore we have to bail out markets. I think that there, that element has been there in central bank management for 20 years. Um, but what we used to call the Greenspan put, I think, is alive and well. And I've said that so much over the last 10 years as I've become a bigger student of it. I mean, I've, I've repeated myself ad nauseum. But I do believe that the Fed views it also that it's not the effect it had on the market, but it's 
the market giving a signal that there is, in fact, this risk in the overall economy and that the Fed is now not doing it because of the market, but they're seeing from the market a signal that they need to take more seriously. I'm of the opinion that the normalization of monetary policy that is necessary coming after the abnormally easy policies that they use to get us out of the financial crisis, the, the normalization is never going to happen without some pain, that there will end up having to be some adjustment that has a ripple effect in the economy. But the Fed, frankly, did a very good job at kind of soft pedaling what needed to be done and very slowly at a measured pace raising interest rates and barely kind of tightening their own balance sheet and removing some of those excess reserves. Um, and they did it at such a slow pace it wasn't having a big impact and we kind of were able to make this initial move towards normalization without it beginning to impact the economy or, or credit markets. And that came to a screeching halt in the fourth quarter. Um, to me, far more than the rate hike itself the Fed hit the wall of uh, them potentially altering health in the credit markets. And with corporate leverage being what it is now, that credit market factor has become very important across the entire economy. And that's where I think the Fed is now. So are they going to hike this year? I don't think so. Something could change. I'm looking at the futures market telling me they're not. And so that could change. But uh, the Fed signaling this week gave a really significant signal to the markets that they're on their hands. Now, I don't believe they're going to be going the opposite direction. I don't think that they're going to do what you would call easing or any form of a mon additive monetary accommodation. But, but I do believe that they're going to be on pause potentially for the entire year. So then I want you as an investor to look at the entire landscape and you say, okay, you have a growing economy, growing in a, it, it will be a slower clip, I presume, this year than last year, but a significantly better clip than it had been growing throughout all of the post-crisis Obama years. All right, fair enough. You have, an, an, with this acceleration of growth, you have a very, very mild, tame, inflationary environment. So one of the fears around uh, accelerated growth is that it becomes inflationary, and that is not good for any aspect of investor markets, but that's not the lay of the land right now. Uh, you see in the housing data and, and oil prices and a number of other big metrics, not, a, not let alone all the little metrics that actually equal inflation, that that genie is remaining in the bottle for a number of, of various reasons. There's enough pricing pressure holding inflation down. So if the Fed is not going to be um, taking the, the good stuff out of the punch bowl that then causes a ripple effect through credit markets, if corporate earnings are going to continue to be growing healthy, as they have been so far through earnings season, we're not quite halfway done, but you have over 70% of companies have beaten their profit expectations so far this quarter. If you're not going to be running into the threat of inflation, um, and economic growth continues to be steady. It strikes me as a very benign environment to be an equity investor. Now, why would we not want to overweight our equity exposure here? Well, for one thing, I think we're already at a healthy, balanced, appropriate equity weighting for our clients, regardless of what their, depending on where their specific liquidity and risk profile may be. But even apart from that, you do still have other headwinds that exist, global economic conditions potentially worsening, and the, the uncertainty around where this trade war will end up and things of that nature. So I, I believe that the runway feels a bit more benign than it did a month ago, and I don't just mean that because markets just got done going up, where a month ago they had just got done going down. Um, any, any idiot can read the most recent rear view mirror activity. I'm more referring to what is a reasonable projection of the lay of the land that the macro circumstances surrounding risk assets right now are better than they were a month ago if one believes that the Fed is not about to go pull a lot of the liquidity out of credit markets. So I think that uh, 
all things being equal, I'd be encouraged right now as an investor that if one did not panic out, um, they have had a nice little rebound here and probably have a pretty good environment in front of them, but I would maintain a risk management posture around those things that are clearly there and are there in the context of a seventh or eighth inning as opposed to being there in the context of a second, third, or fourth inning, meaning where we are in the business cycle, where we are in this stock market, uh, this bull market. I don't know how long more this goes. I don't know where kind of, what kind of extra innings we go. As you know, my belief has always been that's going to be dependent on CapEx and on, on productivity surges. And I don't know how that's going to play out. I'm optimistic, but I'm only cautiously optimistic. So therefore, I think that a controlled, measured, and asset allocated weighting to equities makes sense. And that um, the, the Federal Reserve this, this month, basically, I referred a few months back to this two-headed monster paradigm, it's basically said, we're not going to be the one messing things up, at least for the next three, six, nine months, maybe 12. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to stop the video here, there. Uh, there's a lot more things we cover at DividendCafe.com this week. Love for you to check that out. And please reach out to us with any questions you have whatsoever. Hope you had a wonderful January. We'll have final month-end data for January next week. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy your Super Bowl weekend. Thanks for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe.